thanks, everybody. Thanks, Benoit, for the introduction. Uh, very nice to meet you. Very nice to have you here. I will talk to you today about uh, our ongoing work on what we like to call field-hardened robotic autonomy. So it will be, you will see with opportunity also several results in the field, but primarily I want to relate how field robotics can lead to opportunities to investigate fundamental problems in the science and systems of the robotics technology. So I will talk a lot about uh, what we call resilient robotic autonomy, and I would like to think of, of robotic systems um, in a cons of an evolution. So when I started doing robotics, it was very difficult to actually make a simple demo in the lab. And I'm not so old. I have some white hair now. But uh, it's really not that many years of difference. And now you can see robotics more and more being deployed in the field. And the critical question is, what allows a robotic system to be resilient? And if you think from your perspective, for example, you as, an, as a system, how you can deal with every different environment that you, or situation that you have to deal with, it's the fact that you have robustness, you have redundancy, and you have resourcefulness. If you can't do it in the way that you think you will have to do it, you will find another way to adapt, for example, if you walk on anomalous terrain, and so on and so forth. So we want to think in the same fashion for robotic systems, what can make them essentially resilient in their autonomous operation. Since many of you are students here, I want to mention that I'm sure you study a lot of technical stuff uh, in engineering and other fields of science. But I, I want to mention that for myself, my motivation for robotics started already from literature before I was able to understand basic equations. And this is the guy that essentially tried to present a good future for the uh, incorporation of robotics in our society. So I always put that in my slides. It's kind of a you know, motivation. So back into the technical. I will discuss today three topics. Uh, the case of robotic systems that operate autonomously in conditions of sensor degradation, and I will explain. The second is in very large scale deployments. So in deployments that uh, the limit is the battery as opposed to the capabilities of the algorithms or the sensors. And three, I will assume, and I will, we will impose it in the field experiments, that there is zero teleoperation and zero communications to the robot. This means that there is no way to recover the robot with our student if he's around. So we will just deploy it, and then hopefully things work. Otherwise, we actually have a crash. And a lot of the work I'm going to present today relates to some of our activities in the DARPA subterranean challenge, but not only. If you know the DARPA SAPTI is a challenge that DARPA organizes about robots that go into underground environments. It is over three years. The first year to place uh, and finalize the competition last August. Uh, it was uh, what was called the tunnel circuit, where robots were deployed in a mine-like, underground mine-like environment. This year, we have to participate in the urban circuit, such as subway infrastructure. Over summer, we have to go to a cave. We don't know which cave, but a cave network. And then in the third year, there is a large competition, which is supposed to be comprehensive. And robots have to go simultaneously into all these three different types of environments with three hours of endurance and zero teleoperation again. Right. So after five meters in the introduction to the competition stage, we had no ability to communicate remotely uh, with a robot. So, Let's consider all these situations, and let's try to think what can make a robot autonomous in such conditions. So I would like to think, uh, I'm sure you know the classical block diagram of robotics with control, state estimation, uh, path planning, and so on and so forth. But I would like that we discuss together how these uh, different levels of functionality also interplay. And the typical example that you can think is that a robot that is highly uncertain should plan more safely and less opportunistically compared to a robot that is very certain about its pose and the map of the environment. If I'm super certain about my map, I can fly with extreme agility. If I'm not very certain for my map, then I have to fly more safely. If you have, for example, a flying robot that can afford a collision with a wall, again, you can fly much more uh, with agility and much more aggressively. If you have a robot that is very sensitive to a tentative collision, then again, you have to fly in a very conservative manner. So we want to think the design of the robotics loops and systems in a comprehensive manner and accounting for the interconnection between the loops in order to make what we call a resilient autonomous system. So I will go step by step in this process. I will present only some selective results, and uh, they correspond to results of the last, let's say, two or three years of research uh, with my group. So the first thing that I will mention is what we call sense-integrated multimodal uh, localization and mapping. So think of these conditions as they appear simultaneously, for example, in an underground mine. It is GPS denied. That's pretty common now in robotics research. It is dark. That's still easy to resolve in a way with a LiDAR, for example, it's unaffected, or with lights on board your robot. It is more interesting, filled with obscurance, such as smoke or dust. I guess you drive, and you know that it's difficult to drive through fog. LiDAR gets degraded through fog. Cameras get degraded through fog. So it's also difficult with smoke and with dust. They can be geometrically self-similar. This means that, essentially, we have no, often LiDAR is not possible 
to estimate the robot pose or the map of the environment as the point clouds look identical as the robot navigates, consider a super straight long tunnel. It is simultaneously very narrow and very large scale. And the good question is how can you make a robot that is robustly autonomous in terms of its localization, for example, in these conditions? And the main key idea that we want to present is twofold. A is how you can introduce multimodality in the sense of identifying what are the modalities that intercombination can penetrate all such conditions. And the second one is how to fuse these modalities tightly together. On the first aspect, uh, we have introduced and we try to exploit as much as possible thermal vision. And the main reason is because long wave IR has the ability to penetrate most of the common obscurance that you will have to deal in an actual autonomous operation. So for example, if you are subject to dust in a super dusty underground mine, as they are very common, and especially if you have your rotors of your helicopter uh, pushing all the dust around, uh, thermal vision is one key way to go and overcome these situations. But the problem is that traditional visual inertia methodology, for example, will not be robustly applicable to thermal vision. Thus, you have to innovate about the method. So let me actually start uh, from the latter. We recently, uh, the last two years, we are working a lot in this environment, such as the one that you see there. This is an underground mine in which uh, my students have been deploying this robot in order to explore it in preparation for this year's uh, DARPA challenge. And what you can see there is that the robot is flying through a cloud of dust. This means for LiDAR that the point cloud is over, often occluded, uh, which means that afterwards registration is not really possible. For vision means that we have a highly degraded frame because it's full of dust, which is essentially transient uh, features. And then you can see that in the figure there, I can emphasize this a bit. Whereas, for example, thermal vision is completely unaffected. The problem, however, is that here you don't necessarily have a very strong environment in terms of visual features. Now, a good property of uh, thermal vision sensors, such as a FLIR Tau camera or Boson, uh, is that they provide you a full 16-bit, 12 or 14 actually, but it's in a 16-bit world, resolution about the thermal gradient, which means that if you repurpose your algorithms from the beginning to account for the full resolution of thermal gradients inside the environment, and because even if the temperature is more or less the same as it is in an underground environment that is, for example, 12, 000, uh, sorry, uh, 1,200 feet uh, below the ground, and thus temperature is mostly the same, the fact that you have different materials, uh, ground, rock, water, and so on and so forth, the emissivity is different, thus certain gradients still exist. The key question now is how to fuse them properly. So this is a piece of work that one of my students uh, has uh, published uh, last ICRA. And it relates to what we call KTIO, keyframe-based thermal inertial odometry. It's a bifurcated structure that on the front end tries to find the most significant gradients in the full resolution of the thermal frame, number one. Number two, uses a keyframe to do alignment from the current frame to previous uh, keyframes that have been incorporated in a sliding window. Over this keyframe, it will lose, do some refinement as it does the alignment process from the current frame to the previous keyframes in order to improve a little bit the estimation of the uh, respective uh, transformation. And then we will do uh, optimization on the back end accounting also for IMU errors. So the front end is responsible for what is typically called image alignment and point initialization and also landmark initialization from frame to the 3D world. Now, a key fact of thermal vision is also that you have a process called flat field correction which means that as the sensor accumulates a lot of noise, this actually happens also on normal cameras, but it's very insignificant, therefore you don't really observe it. As the sensor accumulates significant noise, it has to block it for roughly half a second. It puts a black body in front, recalibrates the noise data, and then re-enables the data stream back to you, which means practically for robotics that for you have half a second of loss of data. So in order to robustly operate in these conditions, an EKF, for example, a Kalman filter, will not really do an amazing job as opposed to a keyframe optimization that uses a, a varying number of keyframes in its backend. It uh, does marginalization of the keyframe that you're gonna drop when you have to drop a keyframe, and then does co-optimization of the IMU error the, and the reprojection error from the camera. So to put the basic equations together for you to have uh, an understanding, we, the image alignment relates to the radiometric error, so it's a direct method essentially that relates to the gradients that you have in the thermal frame. We do it, of course, over a scale space, as it is traditional in computer vision. We start from the most sparse, the high level uh, scale space in order to go fast, and then we refine the resolution in the lower level. And then on the co-optimization on the back end, we depend essentially on information matrices that scale and weight the problem between the IMU 
uh, errors and the reprojection errors from landmarks. So we run this in a high update rate. The camera provides us 30 FPS, depending on the sensor you use, but the one we have is 30 FPS, and we run it actually in the same speed, real time, on the robot. So of course the key question in robotics is good, yeah, does it work? And I would like to show you a couple of results. This is in an underground mine in northern Nevada. Uh, the April tags are not, they don't relate to the experiment. We have to deploy multiple robots and we align all robots to a common frame. Therefore, the April tags, that's also how DARPA does it in the beginning of the competition. And then what you see here is the result of KTIO odometer estimation in comparison with LiDAR odometer and mapping in an environment that essentially LiDAR can also work because unless, uh, with exception of this beginning, there are not really many obscurants and therefore we could facilitate something like ground truth in these conditions. What you see on the bottom relates to new features, good features that are introduced, the green ones, blue ones that are tracked from before and red ones that are kicked out uh, from the estimation. And then you see, of course, the proper alignment between uh, previous keyframe and the current frame. So this process will continue. I will let the video only to play for a little bit of, uh, of a minute. Uh, but the resulting fact is that with a very lightweight sensor, with a sensor that does not have influence from smoke or from dust and so on and so forth, disclaimer here, if it is a hot smoke from an active fire, actually this, uh, this camera will not really work uh, per se, but there are other solutions. They are a bit more expensive, however. You have the ability to estimate the robot odometry inside an underground mine and even when, for example, the geometry is self-similar, so when a LiDAR will not work. Now with a LiDAR, typically you solve a large percentage of the cases, number one, but at the same time you pay a, a huge penalty of weight, even the most lightweight uh, 3D LiDAR like that is roughly 350 uh, grams, number one. Number two, it still cannot work in the self-similar geometric situation. So we need to add this robustness into the estimation process. We currently fuse the two modalities in an EKF fashion subsequently in a cascade, and then we have current work on a co common post-graph optimization between the different modalities all together in one single optimization. We also compare our solution with state-of-the-art methods in visual and visual inertia odometry, DSO from TU Munich, Rovio, a modification to use thermal data with 16-bit called Rotio, and Ockvis, uh, the latter two from ETH Zurich and Ockvis now at Imperial with Stefan Leudenegger, and they are Top methods, we don't want to say that actually that we are better in terms of visual inertia localization. What we indicate is that we have a method that is tailored to thermal inertia localization and the methods there, the other ones, don't fail because they are bad. They fail because they didn't never had to account for the fact that thermal data are somehow different compared to visual information. We have deployed this much more extensively compared to just the video that I show here. So this on the right uh, is in case of a theatrical smoke filled environment. That's actually one of the early pieces of work. Uh, and the robot will navigate. Also the environment will again go dark and reliable pose estimation is more than possible. So we have the classical expectation of error, less than 1% as it is typical in visual inertial localization, now applicable to thermal inertial, which is uh, unaffected again from many cases of visual degradation. So I would like you now to think of the following. If we have a robot that can penetrate conditions of visual degradation, and thus it is more robust compared to a traditional system that will merely integrate a visual camera and an IMU or a LiDAR, which will then be subject to all the problems I highlighted in the beginning, the second critical question is what can you do with it in terms of truly autonomous exploration of large scale and possibly geometrically constrained environments? So this is a problem we have been working over the last uh, years also. Uh, again, I would like to emphasize what is the difficulty. The difficulty is that you have a resource constrained robotic system that has to make a fairly large map of the environment, has to utilize the information of building the map in an online process to identify where to go next. Again, I highlight that we don't know the map a priori. This means we have no information for the environment other than the general bounds, like the delta x, delta y, delta z. This environment can be simultaneously very narrow, which means that you cannot simply go fast. If it was an open-ending space, the solution is pretty simple. We just go fast and we don't collide. So it is narrow, therefore we have to avoid every obstacle with caution. And three, we have the fact that we have a difficult situation in terms of perception. Thus, it is not unlikely, and we have to account for the fact, that our robot might be uncertain in terms of its estimation process. So if we try to think of these problems all together in one picture, we have tried to propose three different types of algorithms that we then combine into a more comprehensive system of system solution. 
One relates to accounting for the robot uncertainty, the underlying uncertainty of the state estimation process into planning. And the obvious example that you have to think is that if you're in an environment that on the left side is a, is a white wall and on the right side is a featureful wall, you yourself will look towards the right side to understand where you are. Right? If it's always self similar and, and visually identical, there is no point, to it will not help you to remember where you are. So similarly, a robot should account for visual features in planning to support its slum, support its localization process. Number two, if everything is also self-similar and something is fairly distinct, it makes sense for the robot if it's gonna spend one more second of sampling data from the environment, they better be spent on areas that are visually salient, where attention of the robot makes sense to be spent. And third, if the latter two are essentially local behaviors, the key question is how can we make a behavior that allows the robot to sample and navigate very large scale environments, explore them, and especially environments that have multiple branches, such as, for example, an underground mine. In this presentation, I will only focus really on the first and on the, on the latter, on the third, and then I will also mention a couple of things, but later, about some more recent results for collision aware exploration and some learning based methods to compress the behavior of our planets. Let me go to the first. So, as you know, the full problem of finding where to go, accounting for your estimation properties, and so on and so forth, is the POMDP. This means that it's very complex. This means that the practical solution truncates, typically, the full configuration space of the problem. And here we propose a multi-objective nest optimization scheme that on the first level, the robot in the whatever known space has explored so far, tries to sample a set of robot configurations, paths, that allow to explore towards the unknown space, the pink color that you see there. But as it tries to go there, once it identifies the best path to explore the unknown space, given a certain field of view of a sensor, uh, it then reiterates how should it move towards this viewpoint in a receding horizon fashion, such that the respective associated localization uncertainty is minimized as the robot navigates in the respective pose. So to do that, the second level has to simultaneously account for the covariance of the robot pose and, for example, the landmarks of the environment if we refer to a visual inertial localization solution, which we do so by factorizing the covariance into a de-optimality metric, uh, an idea that comes from the theory of optimal experiment design. And we try to resample possible alternative trajectories that go to our viewpoint by identifying the one that minimizes the arriving uncertainty on the robot. So I will show here roughly a video of how this works. This is a robot that's actually the first paper of my lab here in the US. So it explores the unknown environment. As you can see, it builds the traditional Octomap configuration. The small uh, blue bubbles that you see are the locations of respective landmarks from vision. And here it has identified to move forward. But instead of going straight, you see it repositions its orientations. You also see it once more time to move straight to explore forward but by re-observing as it moves good features that has identified before. Thus, the robot maintains that the associate uncertainty is not exploding. Now, it is important to highlight that this is not a global solution, so we cannot provide a globally consistent map because we don't actually know the map, the full one, and because we are solving only a part of the full problem. Uh, that actually the, the full POMDP problem that we have to solve, but we have to, of course, to do it in a, a real-time fashion. So what you saw here is a bit slow down, of course. Now, again, it's, it's accelerated because it's the robot navigation path. Now, given this component, we can say that we can plan paths that are aware of the respective uncertainty of the robot. Thus, we can explore and try at least to maintain basic consistency of our pose. And, of course, that means most likely that the map is also fairly consistent. So this component is something that we run now at every level of our basic solutions. And therefore, you can consider this low level part to be running in all the other steps I'm going to highlight. And very recently, we are trying to work in this very large scale of environments. So an underground mine, if you have never been to one, it's actually pretty cool. It's a real, it's a factory underground. It's impressive what humanity builds sometimes to, you know, for production and make money eventually. Uh, the underground mine can be multiple miles long. It can be multiple levels uh, across its structure and can have multiple branches where the robot has to explore. So if there is, for example, an underground search and rescue scenario, search and rescue people come from top or from a portal, they enter the mine, and they have to navigate this environment to explore it and identify who they have to save. Now, for humans, it's really simple because we are so capable and so, I don't want to say intelligent in the intellectual sense, but so capable to and intelligent to overcome different environmental conditions and understand how to navigate super complex environments. For robots, it's really not the case. 
So trying to incorporate this capability to a certain extent, of course, into a robotic system, we propose a two-layer structure, again a bifurcation, between a super fast, efficient local layer and the global layer that only has to deal with what should the robot do if it reaches a dead end, therefore exploration cannot continue, should it go to a previous branch and from there continue the exploration process. So in a basic schematic uh, way, this is an underground mine environment, let's say. This is actually a mine that we deployed, the Edgar mine in Colorado. And let's say the robot has been deployed from the beginning, it's a portal, and it's somewhere in this particular uh, position. In this part, we can sample a local subspace of the environment for which we have explored only a part, the one that's behind us, and we haven't explored the area in front of us after, of course, the range of the sensor we are using on board the system. These systems that we use in these environments typically incorporate a LiDAR, so they are fairly long range. In this box that you see in this local configuration space, we can sample some way of identifying the possible paths of the robot. Let's say for the purpose of this discussion, this is a graph-based search. That was the first way we did it, and then we have some other ways I'm gonna show uh, a bit later. If you sample a graph of possible robot configurations, this means that inside those, you can identify the possible topologies of navigation. How can the robot navigate in this explored space? But if every node of this graph is annotated with the associated expected exploration gain, then you can actually, sorry, you can actually think that in this path, we can, in this graph, we can find the path that explores most of the unknown space. So we will pick this path and navigate and explore as much as we know. But it is kind of evident that it is eventually possible for the robot to reach a local dead end. Why? Because it never really knew the whole map. It is therefore, if it navigates a drift, and there are some branches, for example, to the right, it is possible and most likely the robot will continue straight because it gives a lot of exploration gain tentatively, and eventually there is a dead end. At this point, the robot must have remembered in its memory not just the full map, which ends up being of extremely large scale, therefore planning in the full map will become impossible. If it's, for example, a mile long and you need a decent resolution, this is not something you want to do to start sampling randomly in the full map. Instead, as the robot navigates, it identifies locations of the graph that correspond to branches and other openings to unknown space. It memorizes only the specific locations and also uh, writes down a sparse graph that allows it to navigate into these selective previous locations plus to home back to the initial position. So if this is the case, then we can identify this branch, for example, there, the, the intersection. The robot now can reposition itself to the intersection, continue the exploration space as long as there is remaining endurance on the system, and eventually, when the endurance is about to end, trigger an auto-homing operation and return back to home. This is essentially the type of mission you will consider for a truly autonomous system. You deploy it, you never deal with it, you don't have communication, it comes back, it gives you the data. It's kind of you know, inspiring to think that robots can do all their mission without a single point of human interaction. All right, let me show a result of this. This is a deployment that we did in, in Switzerland. Uh, in the DARPA project, we worked together with our colleagues from ETH Zurich. Again, the robot starts with the same Apple tax, more or less. This is the process that you see. This is the local graph. We sample the graph in the environment. The green one is the optimized path. The robot follows the path that you see. It keeps exploring the environment. Now, this particular video relates to an area of the mine there, the Gonsan underground mine. There is a dead end uh, fairly close. And the robot, at this point, will identify that it has to go backwards. So now we play the video a little bit too fast because that was an aero submission and we had to uh, yeah, play for one minute video. So eventually it will go backwards. It will keep exploring now a new drift of the mine. Um, it has some cool parts because we're testing together with the animal legged robotic system from ETH. At some point the robot will go above animal to fly as the one robot had stopped for the other robot to do the process. So here's what I'm saying. And eventually at this point, uh, the battery is going down and the robot will start homing automatically to its initial location. And this is the resulting map that you see from the, from the mine. Now, we can actually take the lessons learned from this process and the key fact that we observe in doing these operations relates to two facts. First of all, speed is what mostly matters for flying systems, especially if you want to go into large scale environments, number one. Number two, it is extremely difficult in these super narrow settings to ensure that you will avoid all possible collisions unless you fly super conservatively, which then contradicts the basic thing that I mentioned before, the fact that you need to go fast. Number one. And number two, it is also a fact that it is still expensive, the algorithms that try to say, despite the, the, the bifurcation of local and, and global planning, it is still fairly expensive for the robot, so this means we spent a good 300, 400 milliseconds for sampling a 10 meter path 
ahead of us, right? So it's selecting a 10 meter path, which sounds okay if the robot flies with, uh, with low speed. But if eventually you want to push the frontier, you want to have super fast planning. So recently, uh, we presented two alternative approaches. One is to utilize the collision tolerant robot and then plan based on the account for the dynamics of the system and also the effect of possible collision in terms of the kinetic energy. So you have a, a mass, you have a velocity. From that, you can find what kinetic energy may or may not lead to a significant bump if you're gonna uh, touch the wall or crush the wall if you want, just an, an affordable collision. And the second one, we try to compress the behavior of our planner through a learning framework, uh, which is initially was imitation learning, and now the guys have converted to an RL framework that also accounts for collision. So this is the result of the first method I tried to highlight. So this is a, a robot that is collision tolerant. It's together with some collaborators. And uh, it carries also a small LiDAR. It's a bit occluded there uh, where we placed it. Now we are uh, repositioning some things. And this is the Voxplox representation that you saw before, the occupancy map from Voxplox. And now the robot will start going inside this underground mine and it will explore it with a speed that was the limit, not coming now from the planner, which was very fast, but actually coming from what we thought at least back then that was a collision tolerant speed. I mean, a speed that even if we touch a wall, we can survive, which is not very high at the moment. Now we have also accelerated a little bit. So this was uh, 1.85 meters per second average speed. And our goal eventually is in such underground mines to go with roughly four meters per second, which may, may not sound huge to you, but actually it's a significant difference compared to what has been presented in the state of the art. So here we will explore this mine, this kind of straight drift, so it's uh, not super exciting. Afterwards, I'm gonna present a result from an abandoned mine. This is a completely different experience if you try to get your robot into an abandoned place. You yourself, actually, you're not feeling sure about where you're navigating. And it was a very narrow place because that's how mines were built originally. So if we play this video a little bit faster, Yes, so here, here we even completely eliminate the need for it to account for a larger uh, size compared to itself in order to avoid collisions. Here we just consider the exact diameter of the robot and you will see it will explore this underground Scholar mine as it is called. And at one particular point you will see it will make a small collision with the environment which is nothing special, but it, the fact is that that was actually unintended. That was not even planned from the from the planner to intentionally collide. That was just happened because the environment was so small. There are some, of course, uh, disturbance on the robot even from itself, right, from the turbulence it generates. That was one of the collisions and the robot then afterwards continues exploration, which what we try to highlight here is that this common thinking between perception, planning, controls that runs an MPC uh, on board and eventually, of course, proper design. Now, for what I mentioned about uh, compressing the behavior, the previous uh, approach was still in the orders of few hundreds of milliseconds. What you see here is in the, actually in the order of, of 20 milliseconds altogether, and this is a full learned framework taking uh, a, a sliding window of point clouds uh, from the, uh, an expert, finding the, take, taking the path, scoring the, the paths of the expert. The previous planner was considered the expert for training this uh, solution, and then providing identical, more or less, paths, such as those of the expert in the, in the online operation. And again, the idea here is complete miniaturization, right? So we didn't want to do learning because it's, it's just better as a keyword. We actually can compress model-based behavior into a much more efficient framework that we can then deploy in increasingly miniaturized systems with fairly good robustness. So of course, we have to investigate the robustness of the framework and how generalizable it is. But in principle, the basic idea is to compress knowing good behavior into methods that are extremely fast to operate online, and they actually rely on much more minimalistic data. As opposed to a full occupancy map, we now only utilize a small window of observations as the robot navigates. Now, for generalizability of results, what I would like to just point out here is that you see the legged robot from, any, from ETH, Animal, utilizing the same planner that I mentioned before, uh, the, the graph-based search, and exploring the same underground mine that I show a result uh, initially, the one that went two times, 20 times faster from real speed. And here the robot will explore. Uh, of course, the underlying locomotion is handled from the controller of the robot as opposed to the high level planner, right? So the walking and, and these things are actually handled from the low level controller as a multi level system as typically robotics are. All right. So I try to highlight a second component that relates to exploration. Again, the whole idea is how can you make a truly autonomous systems and resilience through perception and, and robust planning. I would like now to uh, give some credit for some work that has, uh, is part of our research. You don't see it in most of our field results, but it's actually uh, pretty important in what we try to do. 
before utilizing this collision tolerant by design robot, we had a variety of students that tried to work on, on collision tolerant uh, control. And even before myself at ETH, I worked a lot on error manipulation or inspection through contact. This was an academic piece of work. We put a student, Nikhil, he's, um, he, he was an undergrad back then. So we didn't want him to do something practical and useful, as you will say, for robotics. But we want him to take a, a robot, try to, to touch an environment, and instead of just flying by sliding, we want him to do what kids call the cartwheel. So we want him to take the robot and just essentially walk around the, like walk, like roll around the, the wall just to show that it is possible. And from that, essentially, you know, if you, the best thing that you can do in academia is train good students, right? So that's, that's in any case the most important piece of work we can do. So he took an, an MPC approach that we had. That's the position control running on the robotic system. And then he used the traversability metric to say that, you know what, if you give me part of the wall that is super smooth, I may as well slide on it because friction is not going to be too much and the walls are, are OK to, to slide. And if you give me a non-smooth part, I can use this kind of fly, flying cartwheel mode in operation. So then the robot will go, will establish contact. This was common and known work from us before, so he utilized it. And then it's really not the most dynamic performance of the world, I have to say. It's a weak robot. It's a classical DJI matrix. Uh, it does the job. And it only has the shrouds, it has no other sensor whatsoever. It just uses the shrouds. And we are pushing the wall to make sure that we maintain contact. And then here from the mesh, he knows that it's not actually possible to keep sliding. And he will start a very slow process of doing this kind of flying cartwheel mode that we mentioned before, which again, I'm saying it's not something that you want to do. It's not something that you have to do for a real life mission. Many times in academia, we, we do stuff just because we want to investigate a problem. So this is one of these categories, right? As opposed to the previous ones, this is mostly investigating what is possible. So again, you don't want to do this flight, but it's possible to do this flight. All right, continuing in the same principle, actually, this is this idea of incorporating collision later allowed us through proper collaborations to utilize the system. So here, actually, we are in California in a, in a mine called uh, uh, Black Diamond, a mine in Antioch, and here actually we are uh, exploiting the fact that the robot can collide. We were super excited the moment we got it. Uh, eventually, we were so excited that we crashed, but that's, that's, that's another fact. Uh, and the robot will keep exploring the underground environment there with uh, a bit you know, higher speed compared to previous videos that, uh, that we showed. All right, now uh, going back to the last aspect, the control aspect of robotic systems. So I discussed perception, planning, and I would like to introduce some ideas about control and how can this relate to resilience. So one basic idea of resilience, of course, redundancy. And redundancy may mean that you have more than one system to do the job. Now, you, can, you have seen multiple uh, approaches on multi-robot systems that exist in the world. And there's one, you know, a team of five robots, and they try to do something together. Here, as opposed to the classical approach, we have a linked system. This means that there is an actual mechanical link from one robot to the other robot, which also means that there's communication between one robot to the other robot with whatever bandwidth we want. And also means that we can, because we have a 3 DOF uh, there joined, also with encoders, in theory, although we haven't tried this yet, we can lose full estimation from one robot and keep estimating its pose from another robot, the, either the, the front or the back or both of them. So we call this the area robotic chain. There has been work that relates to the idea. We're not the first that thought uh, this direction. There is uh, some good work for a robot called Dragon. And essentially, we follow similar concepts, but actually different ways of control and, and actually very different goals. So our goal here was to make a reconfigurable system that can do the things, can mi minimize the cross-section of a big system. So we have a collection of systems, a system of systems, but the cross-section can be still as small as we want, the, the size of a small robot. And B, we can reconfigure the geometry so as to maximize coverage or any other need by redistributing the sensors of the common robotic system. So to work on the control, of this robot uh, in a meaningful manner. We distribute the control. Every robot runs an SO3 controller on board. This means that attitude is handled from any robot individually. And only one robot runs the position control of the full robotic system of systems. The position, the control is actually organized on the link level, the connecting link between the, the two robots. And the link role, of course, is left uncontrolled. But the actual uh, role PGO of every robot remains fully controlled. So here you see the robot. This is a bicon test. This is not autonomous, uh, and so on and so forth. But actually, currently, the people are working to make it autonomous. Uh, you see the operation. It will change geometry to just go through uh, different settings, uh, either if they are narrow or if they are open. It might as well just change geometry to full uh, width. Now, if you have such a robot, there are a variety of things that you can do. The first one is you have very good moment applying capability by rolling the robot. This is how the system goes, right? It rolls one robot versus the other robot, which means that it can apply significant moment if you want to use, for example, for purpose of error manipulation, a piece of work that uh, the, the student Juan is, is trying to do at this point. Of course, you can fly classical trajectories. That's old school plots that we used to do when we were doing controls for 
quadrocopters. And also you can rotate all around yourself by still point, keeping the centroid of the whole robot at one exact point, right? And then just going up or down. So as opposed to the classical helical that the whole robot has to uh, go around, here you can make a helix and it will, it will come in a minute. Uh, and the centroid, of course, stays at the exact spot. The idea is that we want to open a valve on the ground so then we can actually rotate without moving the centroid of the robot. So this process can continue. Here we also show that we go up and down, uh, although that's not really our basic intent. So the key idea that I want to present all together to you is that if you properly do the individual job, so research, for example, in thermal inertial odometry, or research in path planning for exploration, or research for uncertainty hour exploration, or motor predictive control, and, and so on and so forth. If you simultaneously not only work on an individual level, but the, the people that do this research essentially design every loop in a manner that accounts for the limitations and capabilities of each other. For example, if perception is going wrong, as factorized from the covariance, planner has to go a little bit more conservatively, then this means, or has to look towards specific features, this means that you make an increasingly more robust and resilient autonomous system. So I want to highlight again that this was the basic idea. From now on, I'm just going to show some uh, up further applications, some previous work of mine be before I, I went and I came to the United States. This was a piece of work that we did actually, that again, here in the US, that we did with DOE and some colleagues from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and it's about radiation mapping. That's the Hanford side. I don't know if you know the story of the Manhattan Project in the United States and storing all insane uh, nuclear uh, waste everywhere in the country and especially in the East Coast. Uh, so there are many of these facilities that are not unique and they're storing their nuclear and eventually, especially now, as there are many, many years since this happened, they have to remap them and re-identify what is the condition there. So here we have a robotic system that does basic exploration as we showed before, but in fact also incorporates three scintillators that all together allow it, the scintillators essentially count, radiation counts, uh, allow it to map the environment. To map the environment simultaneously, not only in 3D, but estimate the respective distributed radiation field. And what we use for the purposes of estimation is a Markov random field, an MRF, and the robot, the robot will simultaneously estimate the intensity, the gradient of the field, as it has intensity, a gradient on multiple points, it can also propagate the associated estimation for the field forward in the other spaces other than those visited. As it does so, it can know which parts of the field are those that are not really identified and estimated properly, and from that, by understanding which are the areas that we really don't know well, we know where to go. So this is a piece of work from uh, one of my students, uh, Frank, who did this work here. And that's, uh, these are actual radiation buckets. That's what students have to deal with. And I'm kidding. The radiation officer put the radiation sources there. Uh, and the robot just goes and explores the, and, and maps you know, the, the radiation field and simultaneously annotates the information on a 3D map. There is a little bit of cheating here. We have a 3D map, but actually we do a 2D radiation, distributed radiation field estimation. Uh, you know, forgive us for, for that. Uh, the fact is that we, we just had to annotate something that looked a little bit more impressive, but actually the radiation estimation is 2D, then the 3D estimation is, is actually annotated with a respective color. So here's the robot in front of the buckets. Now it believes that all the environment is fairly hot because it only has a measurement before the buckets. It will try to go forward because any of these points actually is equally unknown in terms of curiosity, like where should we go to explore better the field. Now it identifies that there is a, you know, essentially a cluster of uh, um, high intensity values there. Now the unknown is again forward. It will go towards the other set of buckets and eventually it will give you a decent estimation of the underlying radiation field. According to our, the radiation officer, he had a proper scintillator for ground truthing our results. The results were fairly accurate. Uh, I don't remember now the value, but we have it in the paper about how accurate they were uh, compared to ground truthing of the radiation intensity field. All right, so summarizing for, for the work of my lab here, the last uh, 3.5 years that we have been uh, working in the United States, I want to, of course, credit our sponsors uh, and our collaborators afterwards. Uh, a lot of the work relates, as mentioned, to the DARPA grant, but not only. Uh, we had work previously with mining companies, Companies. We, of course, NSF and, and other agencies have funded our work. Uh, a little bit of work with NASA. We try to work more in that direction, not yet in space robotics, although my personal goal is to put at least one line of code into space. I'm kidding. Uh, and of course, uh, previous work that related to European projects has, although not directly, has contributed indirectly into the research that you saw here. I very importantly want to credit collaborators. Eventually in academia, the cool part is that you can uh, work together and share together code and, and, and research. So from ETH, from CMU, 
Sierra Nevada Corporation, that's a, that's a company in Berkeley, uh, Minnesota, Flyability, uh, Desert Sets Institute, Proterra, and others uh, that essentially help us into executing this particular work. Uh, very importantly, I want to credit, of course, my uh, collaborators in my lab, postdocs that are now both actually professors, I should update this slide eventually, uh, engineers, PhD candidates, Sherry R, who did the work on thermal inertial odometry, Tung, that has done most of the work that you saw in planning there, uh, Frank, Juan, Russell, Nickel, and others that are now uh, in their PhD processes, Paolo, again, I should update this slide, uh, and others that are essentially working in the lab. And beyond the phases like this, I want to indicate why field robotics is such an exciting experience. This is all from field test, the upper, uh, the right up, and uh, the bottom right is from DARPA. Uh, the other one is an underground test in Switzerland. What you see them, they are eating fondue in the underground mine. That's what Swiss people do. Uh, <laughs> so that's also, I wasn't there, but I missed it. Uh, now let's go back to some, just two or three slides of previous work. That's the one that Benoit was very kind to mention. That's not only personal work, I have to highlight this was roughly 14 people working on the project and the main PhD is called Philip Hodeshagen. He has graduated now, he works in Switzerland uh, and he, we put a lot of effort and he put most of the effort of course to develop Atlantic Solar, uh, a fixed wing aircraft 5.6 meters in wingspan, 6.5 kilos in weight. Uh, that was able to demonstrate what is called perpetual flight. And the idea was that you charge during the day, you keep flying, you cross the night, and the morning comes, you can still charge, you can start charging again your batteries, and you have remaining battery enough to get you through the whole day. And then this can happen again and again and again. So we demonstrated 81.5 hours of continuous flight, and this is the world record for any aircraft below 50 kilos. If you know that there are other systems that go around the globe and stuff, uh, but this is the world record for this particular category of aircrafts, and of course, unmanned aircrafts, given the weight. The system has a battery very similar to the one that you have on, on a Tesla car. The rest is a uh, very good job in, in robust state estimation. That was 81.5 hours of the estimator working properly. Uh, controls, a lot of work on, on system miniaturization and proper engineering. I'm sure you know PX4, PixOc from ETH. Back then, it was a little bit more under development. Many people, have, this, this particular software has a lot of unique software running uh, on it uh, compared to the main uh, stack that you can take online. It has some decent sensing, not too much, because there is not much payload uh, if you want to do the, the world record. Impressively enough, when we started the calculations, it was a limit to do the thing to, uh, when it comes to early morning to have remaining battery. Due to progress in solar panels, uh, flexible solar panels and batteries, of course, we were even a little bit better than our initial calculations. We have actually a tool online about how you can design such a system. So if you want to play around, you can actually enjoy uh, the possible different designs. This system is actually not the ideal design. We stopped at 5.6 meters because we want it to be easily hand launched. But actually, if you can make it a little bit wider, uh, you can have even better properties. Now, again, on previous work, that was collision tolerant, um, that is a video that doesn't play, ah, it plays, okay. Uh, that was a robot that wanted to indicate physical interaction. That's pretty old work to, with myself and, 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 and a student that was doing his semester project at ASL uh, at ETH together with some work on um, pushing objects for some crazy reason. Uh, the robot there writes the, the name of the lab uh, and you can actually see something a bit, it is a very recent work that I'm completely unrelated but it's pretty impressive from ETH that they actually use a robot now to paint fully a wall, they spray it, but they actually would go very close. And the idea came essentially already from back then. That's a hybrid MPC. It has two modes, in contact and in flight, and the controller accounts for the transition between the modes. That's traditional MPC design, so I'm not gonna really mention much because I'm sure you have seen impressive videos with robots flying, plus the video doesn't want to play, so we can uh, skip it, but that's just nonlinear MPC essentially, and later we showed also that we can lose one propeller and keep flying. Very importantly for robotics, we try to open source a lot of what we do, at least what we have confidence that is fairly useful for the community and what we have time, of course, to open source because open source takes a lot of resources. Uh, and we have resource, uh, open source planners, model predictive control, uh, and other things that you may want to use in your research. More broadly, to close uh, my talk, I want to highlight that our, my, mine and our, our basic vision relates to what we call resilience. And I think this is a key for making robots that are truly useful in a variety of conditions to go away from task specific design and make a more generalizable robotic system or robotic system of systems, uh, which also means that then they can be useful in a variety of applications, either construction, inspection, um, work execution together with humans, either completely autonomous or side by side with a human. Uh, so these are possible applications. Uh, I want to highlight that we have a lot of interest into this underground environment, not only for for just for the DARPA project, but I think also there's a lot of room for 
uh, space exploration, for example, in lava tubes on Mars, there is a lot of room for doing very important missions such as nuclear decommissioning. And of course, you can take the same technology and extend it and, and broaden it into further types of uh, applications and scenarios. Before I close, because I see many of you are students, uh, I want to highlight that you know nothing was that would be possible if you, we were not putting effort into good education. So education, I didn't understand it initially before becoming a, a professor, but I think now uh, I fairly uh, grasp why it is so essential. So again, the basic idea is that we try to do courses both on fundamental science and on applied topics such as robotics. And very importantly, and I, I don't know if any of you is undergraduate, we try to emphasize on starting the research as soon as possible in the course of uh, doing your studies. And this is a robot that we will soon put a video. We yesterday tested this ability to go up the stairs. And this was fully designed from undergrad students, and we tried to put them, essentially give them an idea that is a hot topic, give them something that is, we really don't believe it's necessarily possible. But if they feel that it's not possible, then they don't feel that they have to deliver so quickly, right? Then they can think more fundamentally and try to come up something with something that is uh, very interesting and, and fundamentally new. With all that, uh, I want to close my talk. I want to thank you for being here. And again, I hope to get the message about our research on resilient autonomy. I'll be very happy to answer any possible question. Thank you. Um, is there is there currently any kind of development in the sensing field that you're excited about in terms of applying on on your type of application or the exploration? Yes. Uh, I think there are many there are many that are super exciting, and there are, there are people such as David Escaramuz and others that work in active vision, that in, especially in, with event-driven uh, cameras. We have a lot of work because we you see a lot of our research relates to obscurant field environments. We are trying, trying to incorporate polarized vision, and there has been a lot of progress in sensing that allows you to have polarized sensors that are very miniaturized, which means that you can use them, for example, to penetrate conditions of obscurance without the need of even more specific and even more expensive technology, such as the thermal camera. So in terms of the hardware itself, yes, there are many uh, topics that are, uh, can potentially influence how robotics will work in the future. And of course, there is a lot of uh, effort, I think, and a, very, a lot of interest into incorporated attentive mechanisms very early in the stage of the robot. So if you think how we do robotics at the moment, we try to take all the information and use it at once to make a map, for example. But then eventually you hit the computational bottleneck. You can't do everything for a, you can't do it with a lot of data, and you can't do it for big environments. And the key idea is that you can have a very low level uh, system on the camera or um, very close to the sensor that selects what is the most important areas of the scene to process further, as opposed to build what we currently build, which is a super comprehensive map. It's good if you are doing inspection. It's good if you're going to deliver a small environment with a high resolution 3D point cloud, but it's not what you want for navigation. If I'm going to navigate 20 kilometers, I don't want to remember 20 kilometers of X, Y, Z points. Yes. Thank you for the great talk. I was just wondering about the approach with the, with the CNN. Mm -hmm. So, did you try on different mines and how the approach could be used if it's trained in one data set to another mine? So, so we, we have trained the, the system in simulation and only one data set from one mine and then we used it in, a, in, in another mine. So essentially we had uh, very specific data that we put from non-simulated environments. The good thing with range data as opposed to a camera is that the ability to use simulated data is actually fairly straightforward. You can simulate the geometries, and then just afterwards introduce noise on your sensor. With cameras, it's much more difficult to go from simulation to the 3D world. Uh, but here, uh, it was fairly possible for us. So what we did, we just simulated a lot of mine environments. We actually used also previous deployments of ours to have meshes. And then we just took those in, in simulation in gazebo. Uh, number one. Number two, we took some very op op just open models that you can identify. Like DARPA has released models of some mines. I don't know if they exist or they just released some models. We downloaded some CAD files online and we put them also in gazebo. And then what we use is our planner to, to use this as an expert. And then three-point clouds. The three-point clouds are organized on, a, on a two seconds of previous data. So not really the three latest but three distributed over two seconds to allow the robot to identify that, yeah, there is a branch, but maybe this branch looks a bit more large, so I should go in that direction. And then we trade the imitation learning framework. Uh, we also have incorporated something that's specific to the minds. We uh, encoded uh, eight cardinality directions. So as opposed to the robot trying to find where to go in full 360, it has eight cardinal directions. It identifies which direction to pick, and then in that plants a path in the imitation learning. And so do you think that it's generally safer to use LiDAR data to feed a neural network to do planning? Because usually people use camera data, right? 
Yeah, I think they're doing well. Uh, it's, I mean, in research, if, if you see what people will try to do, they will, if, if it's possible to be done with a camera, people will try to do it with a camera. I think it's kind of straightforward, right? If it can happen with a small sensor and a chip sensor, why should we put anything else? On the other hand, uh, I don't want to go into this debate between LiDAR and, 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 and camera that exists all around for some reason. Uh, the question is, if you want, if you need a LiDAR in your application for other purposes, such for example, you want a good 3D map, then you're going to incorporate a LiDAR, then yeah, I, I think for, uh, in terms of, uh, of training, if from simulation to real world, it's much more easy to simulate accurately a LiDAR versus an actual camera. And actually the, the data is simpler, right? It's just a range image. Whereas the other one is an, is an image that has color, uh, it's, it depends on shadow, it depends on the light conditions. LiDAR is just LiDAR. Unless there is obscurance, it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Yeah. Have you guys tried, just to add to your comment about uh, using camera versus side eyes, have you guys uh, tried at all applying structure from motion to the mapping problem from, the, from literally just doing it from RGB? Uh, SF, like SFM, not really. We use densified, we, we do densify with vision, like we, est we estimate the pose, even with just purely visual inertial. We will use, uh, if we have stereo, for example, we will densify the map. But uh, A, we don't work so much on, on loop closure, number one. Number two, we don't really work so much on densifying for purposes of good mapping the map. We mostly care for the navigation problem, but yeah, I mean, that's perfectly viable. Any other question? Yes, yes. Um, so you spoke a little bit about using the CNN-based approach to bring down kind of the order of magnitude for planning time. Mm -hmm. Are there other like tools or even like com like computational hardware that you're interested in to be able to make the same kind of like things? Or like to to re eliminate, re reduce the computation time through hardware. Uh, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, we have one student, Frank, that I, that I mentioned in his PhD. Now he tries to uh, purely work on what we can do on an FPGA. Now uh, there are certain things that, are, uh, apart from the general capabilities, there are certain things that can happen nicely. ICP, for example, is a good thing that can happen nicely on, on FPGA because it's highly parallelizable. Uh, some things don't really work very well, such as, for example, the backend, backend optimization of visual inertia. We leave that on the, on the soft core arm that we have lying around there on FPGA. Uh, CNNs can work very well on FPGA. So we try also with hardware. Um, I think. Eventually, because putting good hardware or special hardware for a case is one thing that you can do. I think the key idea is how can we repurpose actually the algorithm to make it more applicable if you have such hardware design. Uh, and that's why we try to identify what algorithm should we build to make them optimized from the beginning as a design for the FGA. But we're still working on this. That takes a lot of time. I'm sure if you're working on this, I'm sure you know. Awesome, so there's no more questions, let's just thank our speaker. Thank you.